Good morning, boys and girls of all ages around the world. Welcome to the Museum of Native American Histories. Hear our voices presentation today. There is this beautiful woman that cannot be here today, the incredible Cherokee storyteller, Ms. Gail Ross, who curates every month a different storyteller from a different nation. And we just want to send her our love, and we hope to see her in August. Um, we are broadcasting from the land of the Quapa, the Caddo, and the Osage people, and we always hope that what we do honors the people that have walked before us, and also that we start a conversation. The Museum of Native American History is a wonderful place that tells the story through our 14,000 years of our artifacts here at the museum. We're an art museum, but we highlight the diversity and artistry of the first people from all the Americas. And so, what we hope with our presentations is that we all learn to travel well, that we empty ourselves, we listen to each other, and we celebrate each other's diversity. Um, this is uh, our first presentation for July. It is our 14th anniversary for the Museum of Native American History. And um, we braid time. Uh, it was created by Mr. David Bogle, who is a Cherokee citizen and you know, it's an extraordinary story that he has put together to celebrate uh, the diversity of the first people. So we don't represent any one nation or tribe, but this is the place that we bring people in making history today to share their culture and their trailblazing. Um, I don't want to take up very much time because I will do shameless promotion after this. But <laughs> I really want, we're so happy we get to have this amazing person here two times today, one for Hear Our Voices, one for Creative Visions. Um, Mr. Richard Zane Smith is just the most talented ceramic artist that you could ever run into. I've actually run over him the other day. I stepped on his foot and I apologize. But it's not just his talent as an artist. It's his amazing gift as a storyteller, a keeper of the Wyandotte language and many other things. Later on today, my shameless advertising at three o'clock, Rich will be here, and for all you amateur archeologists, it'll be called Reading Ancient Pottery Shards. So, and you even get to take something home. I mean, what kind of, this is a great place. With that, my good friend, uh, just incredible member of our museum family, Mr. Richard Zane Smith. So ha hio jatse anyon ye a ye tarai ne oya tontra na jo task we ko he ne a quatra sa yo me ne a ko ye ti ne de ro me de hwanda a ja tu ta ne sha no ne richard zane smith um I greeted you all and just said it's really great you're here and um that i'm uh, the bear clan the wyandot people and that, um, you know, I come from the, the uh, northeast corner of Oklahoma. That's where our home, my home is now. And so uh, it's just really an honor to be here and to share some of our history and uh, a story, a particular story today for sure um, that, that has a lot in it, packs in a lot of information. But uh, I, I have to first give you a little history of the, the Wyandotte people because we're, our homelands are actually Ontario. So it's like, why are, you know, why are we down here in Oklahoma? How do we get down here? So uh, I'll give the very, very short, short uh, history about that. Uh, in the homelands, in um, the, let's say the beginning of the 1600s, we were in Ontario up by the Georgian Bay of Lake Huron, and our people were numbered about 30,000 at that time, the whole, what they call the Huron Confederacy. And it was a pretty complex confederacy of nations that would meet together and solve disputes and problems. And there were no jails. Um, everything was done very diplomatically. Here's an example. There's a, a man killed somebody from another, a neighboring village. So there's a problem. What happens? Well, the elders from one village get together with the elders of the other village and go, 
What are we going to do? If we don't do something, there'll be blood feuds, and we know that. And so we have to resolve this. And there was a system for it. So what happened was the elders decided it's going to be a gift giving. They talked to the parents of the boy who was killed, and they said, would this make, you know, would this be sufficient for you to receive gifts from the other village? And everybody said, yes, that would be, they, you know, they said that would be fine. Um, and so, uh, with a lot of ceremony, uh, the two villages met together, and the village of the boy who was the murderer um, came with gifts, and they came with beaver pelts, and they just started laying them at the, at the feet of this, the man and the woman who had lost their son, and they just kept laying them there. And they said, you know, may this help to ease, you know, the, the suffering of your loss. And the stack would just get taller and taller until the, the family would say, it's enough. And of course, because our people were the way they were, they didn't want to be considered greedy. You know, they knew, you know, when to stop. They weren't just going to let it just keep going and going. And so that's how things, an example of how a lot of things were resolved. And then once something like that was resolved, it was wiped clean, and they, went, they continued on. But again, our people were great diplomats. They had alliances with a lot of the Anishinaabe people who were uh, smaller bands, and they traveled all over uh, more and hunted, did a lot of fishing. So our people were farmers, uh, longhouse people, uh, longhouses that were sometimes over 150 feet long. Um, it, cold winters, so a lot of work happened in the wintertime. Um, there, were, there were nets to be made, there were uh, materials to be prepared, so uh, it was, it, it's an interesting life. And of course for me, uh, it was fascinating for me to try to understand what was the deal with the pottery making and how did that happen and what was the situation that involved so much pottery making. And I'll get to that later because that's what I'm gonna, we're gonna be showing um, sherds, pottery sherds from different places, different areas and how, um, after being in the clay, this is my 50th year with clay, so yeah, 50 years, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it doesn't mean I know everything and I'm still learning, I'm a, I'm a student, but, uh, but I have to tell you, so our people had alliances with Anishinaabe people, but it was also during the time when the Jesuits had come from France and they were bringing this new idea, you know, that you people are in the darkness, you know, and you need to see the light and you need to have a different way of seeing things. You have to understand the creator in a different way. And so it divided the people in half. You had the Christian um, Wendat people and then you had those who were not who were traditionalists, and that division itself was, was begin to split the Confederacy. Not only that, smallpox arrived, and the medicine people were saying it's those French, they're the ones that brought it, you know. And the, the Jesuit priests were saying, no, it's your, your medicine people, they're all of the devil, you know, and that's why, you know, that's why the sickness has come to you. And there were times of total misunderstanding of each other. The Jesuits, they felt it was their duty to, you know, uh, do last rites on children that were dying. And so they would sneak into a longhouse and start flicking water on babies, you know, muttering in Latin. And of course, the people had no idea what they were doing and freaked out and would say, you know, get away, get out of our house, you know, get out of here. And they chased the priests off. And, and so it was a time of chaos. Um, the people were reduced in half. Some of them fled to the south and actually joined up with Senecas um, and some of the other tribes, the neutrals and Eries down below um, because they didn't trust their own people anymore. A lot of things were just getting shattered. So um, in 1649, uh, a massive raid came from the, the south, the Seneca, uh, actually led by some Wendat people as well, came north and they began to just take over the villages. And so in fear, they had, you know, because they were so reduced in numbers, uh, and the only way that a Wendat could get a gun was if they became a Christian. 
uh, whereas the the British were selling arms to the Mohawk and the Senecas and the Oneidas and uh, just you know just selling them and they had the better quality rifles they had the Dutch arms which were really much higher uh, dependability but anyway the villages were being shattered and they burned their own villages and just left fled one group ended up down in um, Quebec they went with the Jesuits the Christian group the other fled westward and they ended up joining with Tien and Tate who was another longhouse people and also some Ottawa's and they ended up going all around the lakes you know the Great Lakes up through Lake Superior they settled on an island there. Uh, they, they tried to exist on Madeline Island for a while. Um, they tried making pottery. The pottery was different because their grandmothers weren't there. You know, the mothers weren't there. So all they're working with now is memory, you know, and so things were changing already. So they ended up down in Detroit area, which is interesting, but they were invited to come to Detroit. And there was a lot of nations who sort of came around Detroit. It was sort of a big trading area. So hunters would come uh, trading furs. And so they'd have the Potawatomi, the Delaware would come up, the Shawnee would come up from uh, below, and the Wyandotte settled in there. That's where they started to become Wyandotte. We don't know where that extra Y came from because in our language it's just Wyandot. Wyandot. That's the word uh, for our people. But anyway, uh, so some settled there. And it's during this time um, that I'm gonna tell the story. And this is a historical story. We can't really tell the, the talking animal stories and the creation stories where animals speak and interact because those are wintertime stories. And if we're gonna keep our traditions alive and we're gonna reawaken, we have to honor those, those things that our ancestors gave us. Uh, our great great grandfathers and uh, grandmothers. So anyway, uh, in Detroit, just a short one to see how we got here. Um, the group split up. Some of them went into central Ohio, which was unoccupied at that time. The Shawnee had left Ohio and gone east to be closer to trading, to be able to get welcome in those trade goods. And so uh, it was just hunting land. So the Wyandotte um, came right into the center of Ohio. Uh, and, and a group stayed up in, um, in the uh, Detroit area as well. So there was kind of a split. The, um, the group in Ohio, this is, it's hard to shovel, uh, push all this into one little package. But uh, eventually they sided with the Americans because they felt Americans are going to wipe us out. Otherwise, you know, I mean, every time there's a treaty, the land's reduced more and more. They're being squeezed between two little reservations. And even though they were given permission to go tap trees and hunt beaver and uh, raccoons and different things up north, uh, the settlers in the area were not that welcoming and forgiving and would just often kill them. And it happened so many times that finally... Um, after the Indian Removal Act and Jackson's, uh, uh, yeah, the whole, um, that Indian Removal Act passed and Andrew Jackson began to enforce it, uh, the Wyandotte sent scouts out to Kansas. They looked at Missouri. They didn't like the people who were settled in Missouri too well. They didn't think they'd get along with them. But uh, Kansas was a, an open frontier. But one of the things they came back with, they said, is that we're really disappointed there are no sugar maples, which had been such a part of our culture and even ceremonies too, our wahta, the sugar maple tree. So they came back, but people had decided we have to leave. You know, it's just, even though they, um, there were some settlers around the area that really respected the Wyandotte, other people just wanted their lands, you know. And the Wyandotte at that time were living in really nice cabins. They had glass windows. They had, some of them had brick brick homes. Um, they had a school. They had a mill. Um, they, a lot of things were changing. You know, they were really trying to fit in. They were really trying to blend in a way so that they weren't um, looked at as somebody threatening to them. But they still were an independent nation. And they had a, they also were part of the, um, the Underground Railroad. They were helping slaves to escape 
up north, and they actually had villages for, of in in the, on the reservation there that were for from uh, uh, settled by um, slaves, you know, who had escaped. So um, they were forced out. So they took Kansas lands, and in Kansas, immediately after being there and losing 200 people the first winter because of flooding and exposure and not having a place to live, you know, no homes that were built. Um, some of them decided they would take lands in Oklahoma because some lands here opened up, you know, not too far from here. So, um, so they, again, they split. There was two different groups. One stayed and decided they would do what they could because the, the Santa Fe Trail had just opened up and all these wagon trains were coming through. Some of the Wyandotte settlers um, became, uh, they opened ferry businesses. My great-great-grandfather had a hotel. He also was, they had a tunnel to help escape slaves going across the Kansas River. So very involved with the Underground Railroad. Um, there was, it was split. The Wyandots again were split in Kansas about slavery. And so, um, you know, more things, internal struggles you know, really brought down an amazing uh, well-oiled machinery called the Wyandot or Huron Confederacy to its knees. And um, so the small groups came down to Oklahoma. And so there was, that's where they were. We're going to take you back to uh, Detroit, though. Okay. This is a story that's been passed down um, just from oral stories until early 1900s when it was finally written down. And this is the story about the brilliance of a woman who basically saved, um, well, kept a Anishinaabe group and the Wyandots from becoming enemies. They, at the fort, a lot of the tribes would gather for trading and uh, selling their furs. And so guys would come in loaded, you know, with all these furs they're bringing and they'd hope to get some, some powder, some lead for their muskets. Um, and to do some bartering. Well, they also would do some gambling. And there were a lot of games going on when people would come together. There were bowl games, dice games, shoe games, we call them moccasin games, horse racing, um, wrestling, lacrosse, which got really bloody at times too. But um, there was one young man, wind up man, who was just addicted to gambling. And he sat down with an Anishinaabe man who was also very addicted to gambling. And they just sat there with their moccasin, playing the moccasin game. And the moccasin game rules are a little complex, and they changed from different nations and even in different areas. But basically, they lay their, their moccasins upside down in front of them while they sit on a blanket. And they hide a musket ball under one of those moccasins. And the, the other is, is to guess which moxin it was hit under. Now, in some, they'll point to the, one of the ones who's guessing is going to tap the first one and say, it's not that one. Now, if he loses and it's under there, sorry, he loses like 10 points right there, right off. Um, if he gets another guess, he does better. But anyway, they played, these two, and they, a crowd started coming and watching because these guys were so intent. And the Anishinaabe guy, his pile of furs just got lower and lower. And the Wyandotte kid, his got bigger and bigger. And finally, the Anishinaabe kid is so frustrated, he looks around for something to bet, and he sees his rifle, and he goes, my rifle. And everybody in the crowd's like, no, you don't want to bet your rifle. I mean, that's your subsistence. You know, don't do that. And he's, just, he's determined. He's got to get this. He's got to get it. He's got to get his things back. And so he bet his rifle. And... He lost it. He's really, really upset now, and everybody is just, you know, wanting them to stop, just put an end to this game. But the Anishinaabe guy was, he's young, he's, you know, full of life, he's angry, and he just says, my life for your life. And everybody's like saying, no, no, we don't do that here. No, we don't do that. You know, this, that's going too far. You guys need to just stop go back to your own villages, your camps, and let it stop. But they wouldn't, he would not leave them alone. And he pushed that Wyandotte kid. He says, if you're not going to do it, you're a coward, you know. 
And so the Wyandotte kid just went, all right, my life against your life. Everybody, you all heard that, right? And so they sat down, and now people are running back to their elders. There are people going. There's still a lot watching, but people are going back and saying, what, there's something really scary happening here. Well, they played, and the Anishinaabe kid lost again the last time. And he got up, and he just started running, just fleeing back to his camp. And the Wyandotte boy, he got up, and he started chasing him. And just about the time that he got close to the Anishinaabe kid, the Anishinaabe kid turned around with a knife, and the Wyandotte guy stabbed him. So it was like, yeah, he killed him. Now there's a big problem, big problem. I mean, there were ancient treaties with the Anishinaabe. These were alliances that had lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years, and now there's a real problem. So the elders met, just like they always did. What do we do? The Anishinaabe elders were saying, life for life. You know, your, your boy needs to die. You know, he needs to go. And the Wyandotte uh, group would just say, there's got to be some other way. What about gifts? This is what we used to do. And the Anishinaabe said, no, no, it's got to be life for life. So that's what the verdict was, that the boy's life was going to be forfeited. And they went to him and they told him what's going to happen. And they said, you're going to die tomorrow. And the kid looked up and he goes, and they asked him, why did you kill him? He was running away. He said, well, he was just such a coward. You know, it's just like, I couldn't stand it. He was just such a coward, so I killed him. Well, not a good excuse. But anyway, they, they told the kid about that, and the kid said, all right, but I'll give myself over to the Anishinaabe, but I want to ask for one request, and that is, can I attend the boy's funeral first? I want to do that. And so the Anishinaabe gave him permission to attend the funeral. Well, the kid had other ideas besides just the funeral. He felt, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to take some others with me. So when he went to the funeral, he made a big show of tears and just crying, and all the Anishinaabe people are looking at him just like, what is wrong with this guy? And under his blanket, he had weapons, he had his tomahawk, he had a knife. He was ready. You know, if anybody was to touch him, he was going to go after him. Well, the woman who had lost her son was watching. She saw that. She saw something was going on. And in her wisdom, she went up to the boy, the wind up boy, and she said, she said, son, I've lost the only son I have who looked after me, who brought food in the winter time. He brought deer and he brought all, you know, he brought warmth with the skins and the hides. He's the one that took, you know, took care of me. And I'm getting old now and I don't have anyone to take care of me. He said, she said to him, she said, I want to adopt you as my son. I want you to be my son. Would you do that? Would you honor me by taking his place? And the wind up.
I don't have a question, but that story is so beautiful, especially today, about wisdom and and uh, heart. And I, I just really want to applaud you for sharing that with us. Uh, if you could, uh, if there's not other questions, would you mind just kind of giving us a, I really appreciated your, your kind of taste of the language at the very beginning, giving that, that native introduction, uh, but if you could just give us a few phrases or something that we might take with us when we leave. Yeah, sure. Um, one of the things that I've been looking into a lot by studying sherds, and this will come up later as I am showing the sherds that I study, is that a lot of these sherds uh, represent a time of peace. When you look at the, uh, the designs that are put on them, you know, so much of our history that we read, it's all about conflict and war, but to, for a person to build these pots in a village, there's gotta be peace. When you see the lines that are dragged along there with a bone tool, parallel lines that are put into soft clay. This takes concentration. It, keeps, it has a mind that's just at one with the village, maybe a little baby that's tugging on her and wanting to be fed, um, but a peacefulness in the village. And this is something I do notice in uh, looking at ancient sherds. You don't make pottery when you're, you know, when you're at war. This is something that represents times of peace. So these are things that are very important, you know. Um, you know, our ancestors said, and I say it this way, and that is, they're saying that, you know, when we meet together, when we have our ceremonies, our gatherings, when we dance together, when we feast together, only then, the peace returns. And our word for peace, askano. And another one that is a quote from uh, John Gray Eyes, who was of the small turtle clan from uh, the Wyandotte Nation. And he said this, he talks about the, uh, the creation story in just a little wrap up. He says, Amaru reyon gyaowish, utawakke reyon tarijuye, ahano maye o metzarakye, tone ahurishru, itua enda reha de ome, hende te tondi, one ha watenda watonyo, du sa wayera ha tende yon tarijuye husamende de tsaduste. And what he's talking about is the great snapping turtle that comes up out of the water in the beginning of all time, and the water is streaming off of its back, becoming the rivers and the creeks, and the ridges of the turtle become the mountains, and that, that that's the place where Sky Woman came down, and the animals put her there, and she was given that little handful of mud that the, 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 this part of the story, which I can't tell, but I can refer to it. Uh, she was given a little bit of mud and she spread it on the top of that turtle and she began to dance and her first dance we call it rashitu yate it's a type of dancing where your feet don't leave the ground it's a woman's dance and we still dance those today and she started to dance around and spread that earth on the back of that turtle and as she did it began to spread and the turtle began to grow and became the land and everything you know and the seeds that were in that clay from that earth that had fallen down with her, you know, begin to sprout and all the medicines begin to appear on the edges of the turtle shell. So uh, these are all things too that are built in uh, into our traditions. And we know that there were songs for everything. And um, I wanted to sing for you guys a song if you want to hear a song too. <laughs> um, this is a, um, kind of a personal song, it's a prayer song, but it just talks about our Creator. It says that our Creator is uh, He's over all things. It doesn't mean it's, it's not like a, a different, it's a Creator who's just above all things, you know, who put things together and um, He looks after us, um, he, he takes care of us. So, um, 
and uh, there's nothing he can't do. There's no challenges that were too big for the, our creator. Our creator is, is going to be a little different than, um, you know, when other, other nations. But, but I'll sing this one because uh, it captures it all for me. And it's one we also st will actually start ceremonies with at times. process fortunately we do have a great linguist who um who's really been helpful and um, 
and we also have our sister languages. We have Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk. All these languages are sister languages, so they, they really help us to, to fill in gaps sometimes and, and also to find out what our equivalent would be. Because once you find out you know, what, what our sounds are like, and that, a lot of the things are, are just different. Um, there may be things like, you know, we'll say for deer, a skenoto, you know, which it might be translated as that peaceful one, you know, but uh, where the Cayuga might say tewahontes, uh, which is, talks about its ears being long. But it's funny, see, because our word for tehontes or tehontes is the mule. So it makes for a lot of good joking, you know, because, and we even have songs, you know, where, uh, social dance songs, where you get in there and you'll, you sing in a way about, I have this old mule at home, and it's all about clan teases, you know, so it's like, we, um, we, and, you know, those things get um, integrated into songs, you know, the differences, the descriptive language that it is, you know, because our, our, our especially the, the animals, you know, they all have different distinctions of things they do, you know, and so, but, uh, but it's, yeah, it's been hard work, and, um, and also, I've just, I'm kind of a perfectionist too, so it's like I really want to get the sounds right, and, um, and so it's, it's another thing that's a challenge for me is get those nasals, those eh sound, the oh sound, the uh. <laughs> Thank you. What would you say to the youth about the importance of learning these traditions and passing them down? Uh, you guys are our future, you know, and in our Thanksgiving address, uh, in our Thanksgiving address, we give thanks for our children. You know, that's, and we, we say, you know, you children, you guys, you boys, you girls, you know. Uh, we say, we want to say to you, you know, we're really thankful. Uh, you guys are going to be the ones who take this fire and carry it into the future. And so it's really important for them to understand that they, that it's a big, you know, what we're giving them. And when we help, when they have, when they help out during ceremonies, when they're passing out tobacco or, uh, you know, helping out in any way, helping those who are cooking, you know, these are things that are so important for you guys, you know, to, and, and it's so wonderful to see these kids being able to hear that language for the first time, you know, I didn't get it when I was a child, you know, I didn't, we didn't know, you know, we didn't know much even existed or was left. So, yeah, it's a big responsibility to carry, but with that responsibility comes a joy, you know, because they will be the next ancestors, you know, that people will be looking to, so, si jamais. One sec, you can't leave yet. <laughs> I know you have another thing with us. Um, you are our joy. And for all of you, we will archive this to pass on to future generations. That is the third braid of what we do at the museum, and it is my joy, and I am always overwhelmed. There's someone asking about language. There's three words that I would like for all of us, to, you to teach us and say back, and uh, one is hello. Quay. Quay? <laughs> say it. Quay. Quay. Mm -hmm. How do we say thank you? Tu jamais. Tu jamais. Mm -hmm. Tu jamais. Mm -hmm. And how do you say peace? Askenonye. Askenonye. Askenot. Askenonye. Askenonye. Yep, you asked it. Oh. <laughs> Good. Our heart to you. Oh, Thank you so me. much. I'll see you in just a moment. <laughs> and Richard will be in the house for just a second if you want to catch him. And also on our 14th anniversary, we have another huge event. We've just joined hands with Feeding America, uh, bringing in indigenous chefs quarterly to the Museum of Native American History. This is our second dinner. And um, in conversation with our partners over at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, um, they have We the People, the Radical Notion of Democracy, and they have the original, one of the original prints of the Constitution. So we thought, in conversation, we should bring a chef 
and a speaker from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy that are Oneida. And that is gonna be the 22nd is our dinner, and I'm telling you, it is a six course meal. And it's not just delicious food, it's conversation. So Chef Arlie Dockstetter will be here to talk about that. And what I love the most is the idea of all of us, if we could, you know, the idea of the Confederacy to, to, to grow your food, to forage your food, to cook the food together, to share the food together. And, you know, from that, you know, once that has happened, then to have that conversation after the dinner, to have the, you know, what's, what's happening in our community. So what's happening in our community is you, and we thank you all for visiting us today. And I um, hope you'll stay in touch with us wherever you live, and we'll stay tuned for more programming. Oh, but wait, there's more. I have to tell one more thing. This is the last bit. This is our sixth annual Native American cultural celebration called Indigenuity 2.0. And this is a word coined by the amazing Dr. Daniel Wildcat, uh, one of the top uh, environmental science professors in the country at Haskell Indian Nation University. He is one of our co-producers of it. We're the most extraordinary people that will be here October, I mean, September the 19th through the 21st. And it is something that for educators and students of all ages to tune in from, you know, the top indigenous scientists will be here to pop culture to another amazing dinner with Feeding America. So, um, you know, I hope you'll sign up for our newsletter. And again, thank you all very much. Yeah.